good to see Cefessa family and friends and thought leaders. We got thought leaders on the panel. We got thought leaders in the audience and uh, really hoping that we're going to start the week off right, bringing you some value this morning with some good discussion. So uh, if you're still eating, f feel free to continue eating. Um, I know we got a lot of green lanyards in the room. That's all of our newcomers, so welcome. Um, we're glad that you're here supporting us. Um, we're excited about the value that you're going to bring. My name is Nick Cribb. I'm the president of Sam Service down in South Georgia. I uh, run a service company down there. I'm also the vice president of the board of directors for Cefesa, and I'm really glad to be here and be a part of this this morning. Hinch? Uh, yeah, how about it? My name is Dan Hinchley. I'm the Vice President of Manufacturer Partnerships at Partstown. And uh, can't thank you guys all en enough to get up this early and, and join us on a Monday morning. And it's great to see everybody. It's been way too long. So, so today we're going to talk about supply chain uh, issues, something that everybody's familiar with. Obviously, there's global supply chain issues going, around, going on right now uh, across you know, all kinds of different nations across of all different uh, industries, but we're going to talk specifically about the food service industry, and we feel like we've gathered the right group of experts to really speak into that. So that's kind of the purpose of our panel discussion today. Absolutely, and as we go throughout this, uh, I'm going to play Vanna to the Pat Sajak. I'm going to be... <laughs> Spin the I'm wheel. Gonna, I'm going to play Harry to Lloyd Christmas, and I'm going to be the cow to the food service industry, Ricky Bobby, Mr. Nick Cribb. Shake and bake. Shake and bake, buddy. Absolutely. <laughs> but, you know, before we get into this, I know it's early, and I know that I'm out of Cefesa drinking shape in a big way, so uh, thanks for the damage you guys did to me last night. Uh, but before we get started, we get everybody up, look underneath your chairs, and see if you have a sticker that says, Get Real. That's right, I know it's hard for you guys to get up. Tough situation. All right, so everyone that's got that get real sign, hold on to that. We got winners, so you guys get a lifetime supply of toilet paper that uh, I know it's been kind of tough throughout all of this. No. They're actually going to walk around in a second and give you your prize. <laughs> right here. <laughs> All right. So always good to get free stuff, right? That's kind of the Cefesa and Partstown way for sure. So... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's get started with some introduction, guys. I'd just like to start right here. If you don't mind just standing up, introducing yourself, letting the crowd know who you are. Uh, Tim McGan Is this? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, Tim McGandy, Robocoop. I've been with Robocoop for about five years. I'm the National Service Manager. Uh, good morning. Bart Bolton, Director of National Service for APW Baker's Pride and the Star Manufacturing Group. About 33 years in the industry. I'm uh, Tom Vanderbosch with Scotsman Ice. Uh, I've been with Scotsman uh, 21 years, and I head up all after sales customer support for Scotsman. Gene Doerr with Unox, Director of Inside Sales and After Sales Support. Been with uh, Unox since about five years and in the industry since 2008. Uh, Richard Arthur from Duke Manufacturing. Look after the customer experience disciplines of sales and service for Duke. Good morning, David Main with the Volrath Company. I've been uh, with Volrath just about a year now, so Cefes is a bit new to me, but uh, get a great relationship with Partstown and eager to learn a little bit more and meet some new faces as well. I handle the post-sale service side of our business on our, our countertop equipment, smallwares, and refrigerator equipment. Good morning, everyone. My name is Doug Buis. I am with Partstown. I've been with Partstown Group for five years. I oversee the inventory management and analytics, a lot of the global supply chain things. Uh, happy to be a part of the panel. Looking forward to the discussion. Excellent. Thank you. And again, these guys are in the food service industry. This is not the finalist for the 2022 fireman calendar. <laughs> so <laughs> just keep that in mind. All right. So again, we're here today to talk about supply chain issues. So we've, uh, we've all lived through something we never thought we in our lives would have to, 
And out of it, we are dealing with some issues, and the largest one right now is supply chain. So all of you, as you filled out the, your questions to come in here, we're gonna throw some of these questions, as many as we can, to our panel, our expert panel here. And if we have time at the end, we'll open up to any questions that we have from the audience that we have. So we might as well kick it off. And since I don't wanna get in trouble with the rest of these guys, I'm gonna put the pressure on Dougie Slims over here. Uh, Doug, what has been the PT strategy throughout all of this? Yeah, so I guess I would start with saying, you know, we take having the most in stock parts on the planet very seriously. So going back in a time machine and, and before, you know, the COVID and the stay at home uh, orders hit, we made a meaningful investment in inventory and an effort to defend the supply chain, double digit million dollar in investment. Um, so it was a little bit of a preemptive strike, but as we've evolved and as the supply chain kind of turned off and now has been spun back up, it's really been a, a blend of two big things. So, so internally it's been, you know, building the infrastructure in, in, in order to take care of like more customers asking for ET or ETAs, the, the amount of back orders being a little bit larger than usual, but also communication up and down the supply chain. So, um, you know, I call it giving each other the answers to the test. So I want up the supply chain with the OEM partners, many of which I'm sitting next to up here on this panel to understand what I'm gonna buy, when I'm gonna buy, and how much I'm gonna buy. And the answers to the test that they're providing me and the Partstown team is more around lead time and challenges as it relates to production lines, labor, a lot of the things you're hearing about in uh, the mainstream media as it relates to the supply chain challenges. So that's the foundation. And then there's a lot of data and institutional knowledge just kind of in the mix to ensure that we're, we're picking our spots and in, in investing uh, where it's gonna have the biggest impact on end using uh, customers like yourselves. Very you. cool. So I uh, want to pass some stuff around to the rest of the panel here. So the question is what is being done to triage the supply chain disruptions and to find a timeline for, uh, for normalization? So we'd like to start right here with Baker's Pride and see just hear from you guys what you guys are doing over there. Uh, again, good morning. So what we're trying to do is um, what well, we've already determined where our shortfalls are with uh, components, uh, both for new equipment and uh, the replacement part um, that you're desperately needing. So we're, we're doing a couple of things. We are creating new re um, um, suppliers locally for us. Again, most, most of our shortcomings are international suppliers. Very difficult to get them. It's not that we can't buy them, you just can't get them through the ports. So we're um, developing new suppliers locally. Um, we're having a lot of luck with it, but like everybody, every other manufacturer, they're, they're doing the same thing we are, and there aren't, there's just so many um, capable suppliers out there that, uh, that we can all go to. So it's a challenge. Uh, the other thing is we are cannibalizing comp uh, new equipment uh, to keep you guys up and running, keep our customers happy. So it's, it's a challenge. Yeah, that's an interesting approach, making sure that you focus on getting the people in the room what they need. Uh, what about Scotsman? What's Scotsman got going on? Yeah, so with Scotsman, it's uh, similar to Baker's Pride. We are doing everything we can to get both units and parts out to the field. What we've done is parts come in, and we have parts coming in on a regular basis, and then we have to kind of determine how do, how do we satisfy the, the needs in the field for service and how do we continue building product. And one of the things we, we've done is focus on the emergency order side of things. So if somebody needs something, a, a part in the field, get it in on an emergency order, and for us, that'll take priority because when, as parts come in, we're looking at, at how, how to uh, allocate those parts and what, what, what the best place to go is. Um, we have, um, it, it's not as easy for us to look at alternate suppliers because uh, a lot of our products have the uh, uh, certifications and they have to be retested to have alternate parts put in. Uh, we have done some of that and we have some, uh, some backup parts we're using but uh, it's a challenge that we face every day. If, if I can just add to, to the recertification, um, we do the same thing, but it, it's time, and it's very, very costly. So um, I, th I think we're all trying to 
to uh, to do as much as we can to keep those parts flowing. But it do, it does take a lot of time and effort to get to get uh, new parts. No, no, understood. What about Duke? Um, so, two things really. I mean, engineering deviations are certainly some things that we're doing a lot of. So, if we don't have a specific part in stock, looking for an alternate. You know, something I think about that could be an unintended consequence of that strategy is we send a service company out with a part that doesn't look like the part that's in the unit. So we're really trying to figure out a way to make sure that when we dispatch that we understand that this particular unit had an engineering deviation in it. Same form, fit and function, just different part number or it looks different, different manufacturer. So that's one thing we, we're spending a lot of time doing. Um, also, admittedly, we did a poor job working with Partstown up until about a year ago managing you know, their inventory and making sure we were supporting you know, what they needed in order to be successful you know, feeding the market. So fortuitously, I guess, we embarked on a, an improvement initiative with them to make sure we had open lines of communication as to what parts they need the most desperately, and we prioritized that way. So I think without that, I think we would have been in a bit of a pickle because you know, we got a poor report card from parts time. We didn't take that lightly. <laughs> now it's an A+, plus, right? Right, now it's an A+. Plus, so. We still struggle, like everybody else is, but I think that, that dialogue and that cadence that we've got as a result is helping us stay out of trouble for sure. David, Tim, you guys got anything you want to add on to this? Is all pretty much the same that you guys are dealing with? Yeah, it's pretty consistent across the industry uh, for certain, but it's understanding our limitations and understanding our suppliers' capabilities and, and making sure we're communicating on a daily basis with our suppliers for our need. OEM parts are critical in what we do. Uh, Non-OEM parts are not what we believe in at Valraf. So it's, uh, if you're looking for alternatives, it's aligning yourself with the proper parts, uh, with the proper suppliers. Perfect. Excellent. So the next question, Tom, no pressure. This is being directed exactly towards you. So what does the future look like for clearing, minimizing the current delays in large equipment availability, such as coolers and ice machines? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so, and again, it is a challenge. And one thing, and everyone may know this, but to state the obvious, without a single part, and about every part that goes into that machine, you don't have a finished uh, piece of equipment. And we've done things like uh, when we have freight damage units, we're taking parts out of the units to put those back into new production. Um, and we're doing everything we can to, to keep the, the new, new units coming off and to satisfy the back orders. Um, it's hard to put a, a timeline, if you will, on the the uh, return to normalcy. There's a lot of uh, estimates out there, and but we are working with suppliers, uh, just like everyone else is. And um, again, I, it's just a this is a challenge we don't don't know the end of. But uh, as we work with our suppliers, um, and again, if it's difficult to change or to uh, to create that deviation and make make uh, the machine with different components. But we have done that, and um, we are working as best we can to, to get those, uh, the, the uh, parts in and make the units. And Gene, I know you stepped into a couple new roles there at Unox, and you're wearing a bunch of hats right now, and I think you could give a unique perspective too. So maybe explain to everybody kind of what you're doing in your new roles there, and then offer some perspective. Sure. Um, for Unox, things are a little bit different. Um, the fact that we're a vertically integrated company, meaning that we produce most of the parts in our equipment, we haven't had the same um, delays from a material standpoint. Um, what the biggest thing that has affected us is we're probably paying two and three times more for a container load um, to get across um, from Italy to the U.S. Uh, we are doing some things. Uh, to combat that as well. I mean, every container that comes over with equipment on it has a spot reserved for spare parts. Uh, the second thing, uh, as we have <clears throat> recently um, started working directly with Parts Town, uh, every month, or every actually every week, I go through and look at what parts that we're going to order. Um, and obviously, we look at what we've used in the last three months, what we've used over the you know per month over the last 12 months. Well, obviously, when we started working with Parts Town, that increased dramatically, but I didn't change the amount of parts I was buying from Italy. So we'll have um, quite the backup in our facility as well as at Parts Town. And then the, the third thing we're doing is we're actually adding on to our building uh, to bring production to the U.S. as well. 
Very cool. Tim, what are you guys doing over at uh, RoboCoop, buddy? Uh, we, are, like everybody else, we're diversifying where we're going to bring our product into. We've uh, using instead of using one port, we're using three ports. Uh, we airship a lot of uh, parts over, again, costing two and three and four times what it would normally cost for uh, for shipping. So we're, yeah, we're doing this, a lot of the same things these guys are doing, diversifying and, and buying more parts and um, uh, just trying to stay ahead of the curve. Excellent. Thank you. So this one should get a harumph out of the room. And don't try to answer it all at the same time. Will manufacturers be adjusting warranty coverage based on the current part shortages? Good luck, gentlemen. <laughs> May the odds forever be in your favor. Oh, wow. I'll jump on it. Uh, I'll, I'll jump on it. Most of the utensils uh, are clear. It, well, we're, you know, we're not going to change our, our warranty coverage. I mean, just trying to keep up with that per individual uh, end user would be it would be a logistical nightmare, in my opinion. But no, we're, we don't have any plans of doing that. So we're, Sweet or short and sweet. Yeah, at Scotsman, we've had that request come in as well, and we're the same. To, to manage each piece of equipment with a different warranty would be really a monumental challenge. Uh, but what we have told customers is, you know, we'll absolutely give some consideration if something down the road happens. Um, we we want to work with our customers and with our service providers and make sure that we're we're doing the best thing to take care of our customers and stand by on our products. So while we can't change every single warranty because of a, a, a part delay, um, we certainly want to support our, our customers and, and everyone out in the field. So, Yeah, you know, as a service agent, it's good to hear that you guys are trying to break barriers and adapt and overcome, trying to get these things that we need and, you know, allowing costs to get in the way. And, you know, of course, we aren't either. We're dealing with these end users who just want their ice machines working, right? They want their fryers cooking. It's not a fryer problem or an ice machine problem. It's a financial problem that they have. They can't drive revenue without these particular things. So the partnership is, you know, we appreciate you guys doing what you're doing. And, you know, from the end user, we're trying to communicate well, saying, hey, you see everything that's going on in the news with all the, you know, the port of the ports in, um, in California with all the ships out there, and you see that you can't, you know, get stuff like you used to be able to and things are more expensive with inflation and this, that, and the other. So, you know, we're having those communication pieces with the end user, but it's good to hear you guys are partnering with people like Partstown to, to try to overcome some of those things, so. You want me to take the next one, Nick? Please, you're doing great. All right, absolutely. Uh, communications best practice. What kind of information do service companies and manufacturers need to share to get ahead of the supply chain issues? What are some of the best practices? Well, using parts towns definitely helping us, and I'm not saying it just because you're here. I'll pay you later. Okay. Um, their ability to reach out to everyone here uh, within Safesa and, and all, all the other organizations, and even, even the end users, has been um, probably the most valuable uh, tool that we've had during this whole COVID uh, supply chain issue. Um, I know we speak probably, if not every other day, at, you know, three, four times a week, um, just making sure that we stay on top of uh, the current needs with both of our organizations as well as everything in the field. So um, it's, it's just been a, uh, an incredible practice for us, and it's been a learning experience for us. Something that um, I know Middle Middleby is uh, quite pleased that um, you know we've we've stepped into that relationship. So, Richard, I think you had something to offer. Yeah, so I think uh, this is an uncontrollable situation, reality. Right, it's our supply chain director says this is going to carry on until 2022, 23, 23 probably. It's not going away anytime soon. So you know what we're really trying to do is figure out a way to create the illusion, perhaps, that we're in control of an uncontrollable situation. Right? So every single order, every single you know, parts order, every single finished goods order has dependencies associated with it. We all have pretty sophisticated ERPs. Pulling data out of that, just so we can arm our people with information that enables them to tell our customers, if these things occur, we can succeed. If it doesn't occur, this is the consequence of that scenario. So at least from our standpoint and from a customer experience standpoint, it's just about arming our, our technical service people on the phone, you guys in the field with information that says, don't have the part, but 
It should be here next week or the week after. If it doesn't, that's the consequence. So that's the only thing you can do, really, because it's not going away anytime soon. And uh, it's like playing whack-a-mole. So further than that, you know, it's understanding your lead times so you can arm the service providers with the right information. So yeah. instead of walking into a customer saying, oh, it's going to be six months before we get this part, having that information conveyed to everyone is critical. And, and that's understanding our supply chain, understanding our limitations as manufacturers. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I know a lot of times our customers are ringing that bell with us saying, hey, when can you get it? And we don't even have an ETA, right? We're like, you know, there is no ETA. And it makes us look incompetent. So, you that's know, un that. that's unacceptable. Yeah, yeah that's where right. Where can I get it? Don't know. <laughs> Why not? Don't know. <laughs> it's awful. So we've got to figure out a way to kind of become more educated, I guess, around what the consequences are and the, the trade-offs are in the supply chain because we're going to be in this for another 18 months. Have you guys put any strategies in place since COVID has struck that you didn't have before, but looking long-term that you'll put in place with this? I think this, you know, we, the way we look at it is almost like that Domino's Pizza app, right? That's the outcome, right? That every single scenario should have that kind of visibility. That's the, the strategic thing from a technology standpoint that I think is going to benefit all of us. There'll be far greater visibility to everybody around, you know, where orders are, where uh, information is, any of those kinds of things. Um, another thing we're spending a lot of time on from the service standpoint is how do we keep our service company supportive of our dispatches without, you know, uh, clogging them up with unnecessary training or anything else, right? How do we help make them more efficient? We had a good conversation earlier on time management, right? And how do we become better at supporting your ability to maximize your time on the road? So those are things that I think unintended consequence of this too. Excellent. Anyone uh, have anything else to add to that? Or Yeah, additionally, we're looking already looking out at 2023 for material planning on the front end of the business just to get ahead of the curve, partnering with the suppliers that will get us the raw materials so we can make our components and make our equipment. Tom, I believe you're about to jump in there. Yeah, I was just going to say it is kind of a, a two-tier uh, strategy, right, because you have the the uh, daily challenge of how do we get parts out today and how do we satisfy current needs and at the same time what's happening down the road as you're forecasting in the future and and when things will end and I think um, or, or return to some type of normalcy and so we're all kind of battling that same challenge but it is a uh, there is a long-term uh, approach to this as well in understanding you know our business and and the lead times and making sure that we have our our forecast down the road. So it is kind of that two-tier strategy where we have some people that are just every day, you know, where are parts going today, and then where are parts coming from down the road so that we can satisfy that future demand. Yeah, just a quick snapshot of, of our business. We're, we're talking about replacement parts for you guys and our customers. We also have to look at the new equipment orders that we're getting. So our business, um, we describe it as, as a funnel. If you turn the funnel upside down, that was, that was us before COVID. Small hole in the top, big hole in the bottom. We could produce more than we were getting primarily. That funnel has turned the other way now. We've got, we've got customers just getting in line now because they know how bad the supply chain is. So we've got more orders that we can fill than we can build. We've lost employees. We've lost that ability to manufacture because of COVID. People just do not want to work. So we're have, and I'm sure you guys have the same problem. So we're trying to be create. Plus, we're shutting a factory down. So and moving products. So things are challenging, but we're finding a way to do it. Um, and this partnership that we have with you. Um, it, you can ask for a, for, a, for a better system, for better people to help you through this situation, but it is challenging. Partstown, one of our biggest customers, they're also standing in line with everybody else so we can fill those orders. So it, it, it's, it is very challenging, but that's a snapshot of our business. If I could quickly just add, um, you know, we've talked a lot about we got some choppy water still yet ahead. But I would, I'd be remiss if I didn't call out that the silver lining, at least from my vantage point, is 
we are going to be much more intimately integrated up and down the supply chain post this. And we're seeing those things with some of the examples that were displayed here or discussed here, but integrating ways to reduce variation. Variation is the enemy of predictability. So maybe in the supply chain of old, we were able to absorb a surprise or two. Um, but with this you know, black swan event, it's highlighted opportunities to mistake proof these kind of variations or surprises, whether it's a PM rollout with a customer or you know, a challenge with, within a production facility with a manufacturer. Uh, we are deeply integrating what we're planning to buy into their ERP engines in many cases, so that's triggering demand sensing upstream to their suppliers to a level that prior to this event was not in place. So I think we're going to be a leaner, meaner, faster, stronger supply chain at the other end of this. We just have a little bit of wood to chop yet. Thank you. So staying current with this, what disruptive supply chain techn technologies deserve immediate attention? Say that again. <laughs> what disruptive supply chain technologies deserve immediate attention? Can you clarify the she question? Should be playing the Jeopardy music <laughs> at this point, you know? And it's the last question I have on this before we open it up. Well, technology-wise, it's, it's hard to say technology, but looking at getting material from the West Coast to the Midwest, it's log jam in the ports. We wait for train cars to get loaded up with uh, containers to get to the Midwest. Let's look at it a different way. Let's put them on trucks and drive them directly ourselves. That's one way we try to get over getting material faster to our region. And in Valrath, we're in, the, in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. We're in the heart of the Midwest. So it's getting those parts to us faster rather than paying for a train car and the time it takes for it to get there. We'll just go send a truck and get it ourselves. And that seems to have uh, helped in the short term at least. But that's a, a, I'll call it a technology, but it's a transportation logistics issue we had to overcome. I think it's less about technology at this point. It's more about just solving problems on the fly. I mean, it, it's, it's whack-a-mole. That's the only way you can describe it. I mean, you don't know where the next shortage is going to come from. And, uh, anyway, so it, it's technology I think will follow. I think the communication and integration and alignment is really where the focus is now. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So let's open it up to the room. Let's just keep in mind any questions that you have. Let's try to keep it about the supply chain issues that we're currently facing. So does anyone have any questions? We've got about eight minutes. Oh. There we go. Hey, oh. Wayne, how you doing, buddy? Kind of piggybacking on that last question about technology. Sir, what's your name, sir? Please oh, tell the I'm room. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, my name is Wayne Stoutner. I'm the CEO of Duffy's AIS. I'm also a vice president of Cefesa, along with Nick. Thank you, Nick. <laughs> and I'll sit down and ask the question. So it's, it, it's basically piggybacking on that same last question that, you know, with technology. I know our industry is small, and a lot of the, our manufacturing um, companies are small, but, you know, McDonald's with the kiosks, right? So they're, they can't hire people because they can't find people, so they have kiosks. So now, you know, they're, they're having – is there any – Thing that you guys foresee in the near future, five, ten years, either in light robotics, you know, to help manufacture your equipment, or you know, some kind of um, per administration, some kind of technology that maybe helps tech support, something along those lines. Or is there anything like that you guys see in the pipeline? From from Duke's standpoint, there's so much variability in what we make, right? And it's often bespoke to a specific customer. So automation, we do as much as we can, but there's still a lot of touching and customization by customer. So, you know, I was, just, I was trying to think of the statistic, but our, our manufacturing guy said he hired 500 people to hang on to 100. Right. And it's, it's unbelievable what the churn looks like. So, and I think the, the other silver lining in all of this is, at least from Duke, and I think a lot of manufacturers are seeing the same thing, demand is through the roof. Right, so I mean, we, our backlog is bigger than it's ever been, right? And we cannot find people, and we cannot find parts to produce. So I don't know whether you can fix that with technology, honestly, you know, because there's so much variability in the product that we make. Um, but there is as much automation as we can get, I guess, at this point. 
I know at uh, Robocoop we're trying to focus on, and this may be a little behind the curve, but uh, in France is where we're located, and we're having more and more uh, service tech videos is what I'm requesting. So, you know, like kids, how do you do this, Dad? And they look on Google and look at a video, and we're, we're doing the same thing. We're trying to get more and more service videos so uh, we can send them a link and they can look at it and go, okay, that's, that's your machine, this is your part, and this is how you do it step by step. So we're, we're trying to get more and more service videos out there for the, for the techs. One other quick question. Um, for you guys that are, uh, have international um, ties, interna um, is, that a, is, it, is it an interna international problem, a uh, labor shortage? Definitely, that's uh, getting people to run the production line um, in Europe is as difficult as it is here, I believe. So. Why? <laughs> Why is that? It's a global problem. You better get so the microphone back from him. If you, look, you looked at happen, what, what we did in the U.S. to manage through the pandemic, that was duplicated all over the world. Um, so I think those same social pressures and you know, labor shortages and supply chain shortages exist everywhere. My name's Rusty Park. I'm with Banco out of Indianapolis. I picked up on a couple of you had said that it's incredibly expensive to get something back through UL or NSF. And that immediately spurred my thoughts on the component manufacturing piece of it um, and substituting parts to, to be able to get your product up and running. What is the timeline to get something certified NSF UL to begin with? And how are you getting it done so quickly? to be able to make those substitutions? The key is um, having, a, having a, an engineering department that is flexible enough to, to work on um, both new product development and sustaining product. So when we have to substitute, understand that the UL file is set to specific standards, specific uh, components that are listed. And if you go through changes for those components, and, and sometimes it's, a, it's, as, it's as simple as, or as, as uh, easy as going from a four-wire plug to a three-wire plug. If it's called out uh, as a four-wire plug in the UL standard, has to be a four-wire plug. So you sometimes UL will just take a letter um, from us explaining why the change and what the change is, and they'll approve it with that letter. Sometimes they need that piece of equipment. So now you have to make that piece of equipment with that new part, send it to them, and get in line. Yeah, you have to get in line, just like everybody else does. Um, and they'll get to it when they get to it. And then you pay. It's, it, it's not unreasonable to get a $25,000, $30,000 bill for that. So every time, every part you change, you have that bill. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, a, it's a very costly, time-consuming process. And then you have to balance that as well with uh, your current supply or your current part, and when is that part going to be available and, and now, now becomes the, 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 the trade-off of when you make that call to say, yeah, we want to go ahead and get this uh, alternate part approved. I think we have time for probably, probably one more question. So anyone have a question? All right, Nick, you got to run over there, pal. Good morning. Uh, I'm Brad Crodel with Equipment Plus Total Facility Solutions in North Carolina. I'm just curious, with all the strains and pressures on the labor force as well as the supply chain, are you seeing more uh, DOA parts, DOA equipment? Um, are you having more quality control issues? I, I think the shipping damage has quadrupled over this, <laughs> this period. It seems like the, uh, the carriers, uh, I mean, my equipment's not real, real big. It's, you know, tabletop stuff. And uh, I don't know what they do when it leaves the dock, but we're, we're getting a lot of um, shipping damage that we're seeing, I think, a little uptick in that. So um, I'm not sure. I'm, and we hadn't changed our, uh, sometimes, well, I'll give you one example, shipped a part to somebody and it was damaged and we shipped another one and it got damaged. So we shipped a third one to a different carrier. Hey, it was perfect. So, and didn't change our packing, uh, this, uh, what we packed the, 
piece of equipment. So uh, not DOA has not been a huge deal for us, but more shipping damage that I've seen anyways. Yeah, we're, we're seeing the same thing on the ball right side. It's the shipping damage, the freight handling. It's driving us to be, provide more robust packaging just to take care of that. And, and that's usually the culprit of something showing up not working. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and land the plane for us. I know we all got a lot of people to meet with, a lot of things to be a part of today. We appreciate you guys starting your morning out with us. Um, I would tell you that the, uh, the purpose of CEFESA in general is to be the standard of excellence. And, and one of the ways that we do that is by having open and honest communication with people that we trust. I mean, these are, again, these are thought leaders. These are guys who qualified themselves with years and years of experience, and they're opening themselves up. Um, you know, even at SAM's service, we say that we earn trust through clear and candid communication. And sometimes the candid part can be a little sticky, right? But we got to keep it real with each other. we got to work together because uh, it's not going away, sounds like, until 2023 at best. But um, be encouraged. We're all here together. Um, you guys, uh, grab you another piece of egg if you want on the way out. <laughs> See you. Thank you very much.